welcome to this edition of The Astronauts. I'm Lynn Bondurant. During the next half hour, we talk with former astronaut Michael Collins, who was on the first manned mission to land on the moon. That mission is called Apollo 11, and it culminated in one of the most significant events in known history. His two companions, astronauts Neil A. Armstrong and Edwin E. Buzz Aldrin, were the first two human beings to walk on the moon's surface. The mission took place from July 16 to 24, 1969. It lasted 195 hours, 18 minutes, and 35 seconds. As called for by the mission plan, Collins did not descend to the moon's surface, but remained in lunar orbit with the command module. Before we go to our interview with Michael Collins, let's see part of a 1969 film documenting that historic flight. The film is called Eagle Has Landed, The Flight of Apollo 11. Other astronauts had made this journey to the launch pad, but never with such anticipation. 9.32 a.m., July 16th. Three hours later, the Apollo command module moves forward to extract the lunar module from the third stage of the launch vehicle. Both are moving at more than 17,000 miles an hour. Docked together, they will sail a quarter million miles across the sea of space and into orbit around the Earth's nearest neighbor. During the three-day journey to the moon, the astronauts kept busy checklists, navigation and observation, housekeeping. They must work in a weightless environment, keeping their spacecraft and themselves in good condition. Data must be collected and reported. Experiments must be performed, including photography both inside and outside the spacecraft. Because of the film speed, these actions appear faster than they actually were. July 19th. Apollo 11 slows down and goes into orbit around the moon. The bright blue planet of Earth now lies 238,000 miles beyond the lunar horizon. Astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin, now in the lunar module, separate from the command module. Astronaut Collins remains behind. Preparation for the lunar module descent to the moon now begins. The 
command module assumes the new name, Columbia. The lunar module will be called the Eagle. From Columbia, Michael Collins' camera sees bright rays of the sun reflecting patterns of color from the surface of the eagle. In this strange metallic bird rides the ancient and endless dream of all mankind. The command pilot can see detail which his camera cannot record. The four landing pads of the lunar module are fully extended and locked in place. The eagle is poised and prepared for its descent to the lunar surface. The moon landing craft rocket engine fires to slow it down and to place it on the pathway to the landing site in the sea of tranquility. There is tension and caution as the eagle flies lower. Warning lights blink on as the computer tries to keep up with the demand for control data, but the status remains go. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good, over. Roger, copy. Eagle, Houston, after you're around, angles, uh, S-band pitch, minus nine, y'all, plus one eight. Roger, you're a go to, con you're a go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. Altitude now 21,000 feet, still looking very good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great to us, Eagle. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Good radar data. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 4,200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Top alarm. Altitude 1,600. 1,400 feet. Still looking very good. 700 feet. 21 down. 33 degrees. 100 feet. Down at 19. 1201. 1201. Roger. 1201 alarm. We're go. Same type. We're go. Altitude. Velocity. Light. Three and a half down. 220 feet. 15 forward. Coming forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet, four and a half down, five and a half down, 60 seconds, lights on, down two and a half, forward, forward, at 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust, four forward, four forward, drifting to the right a little, at Okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Through the window of the Eagle, Armstrong and Aldrin see what no human eyes have ever seen before. Their spacecraft casts a long shadow across the undisturbed dust of centuries. Seven hours after landing, after careful preparations for later ascent were completed, Armstrong opens the Eagle hatch and begins his climb down to the surface. first footsteps on this strange new world must be taken cautiously. The moon has only one-sixth the gravity of Earth. The nature of its surface was still unknown. I'm going to step off the limb now. 
That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Now that we've seen some of the historic film of the Apollo 11 mission, we're almost ready to go to the interview I had with Michael Collins following the publication of his second book, Liftoff. But first, here's a little background on Collins. Michael Collins is a retired Major General in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. He was born October 31, 1930 in Rome, Italy. He earned a Bachelor of Science from U.S. Military Academy. Besides Apollo 11, he flew on the Gemini 10 Earth Orbital Mission, which was preparatory for Apollo missions. Collins walked in space during the Gemini 10 mission for one hour and 30 minutes. Astronaut John Young flew with him on that mission, which lasted from July 18th to July 21st, 1966. Now let's go to my interview with Collins when I ask him what he was trying to accomplish with his latest book, Liftoff. Well, I think people have very short memories, and I thought it might be interesting to go back uh, 20 years or so, uh, 19 years it's been already since the first lunar landing, but to, to go back to the time of uh, John F. Kennedy when he first started Project Apollo by, uh, by saying he wanted uh, to send a man to the moon and return him safely to Earth by the end of the decade, the decade being the 1960s. And uh, I thought it would be kind of nice to put down in sequential order uh, some of the preparatory steps, uh, Project Mercury, Project Gemini, Project Apollo, uh, and to talk a little bit about the, those machines and, and how they worked, but also to talk about the people who put them together, the people who flew them, and then just to keep that going right on up through uh, Skylab, the shuttle, an examination of where NASA is today, and then some possibilities for the future. So that's fundamentally what the book's about. Mike, looking back to the days of the Gemini and the Apollo programs to today's um, flight of the shuttle, what do you see as some um, differences as related to astronaut training? I think the, uh, the shuttle is more complicated by far than the early machines were. The uh, Apollo command module, I thought, was a, was a real handful. Uh, it was, uh, to me, it was sort of like painting the Brooklyn Bridge. By the time I got to the end of it, there was something I'd forgotten at the beginning. And it, for me, it was a constant process of, uh, of education, of learning. Uh, and yet they tell me the shuttle is probably the equivalent of four command modules in complexity. So that's the, the, the main difference. What about, you know, public support, comparing it, you know, in the past during Gemini, Apollo, and today? It seems as though in the past, there was a lot more public support for going to the moon than even there is today for, say, putting a space station in orbit. Well, I think there are some fundamental differences. Uh, one is that uh, President Kennedy got very personally involved. Capitol Hill in those days was more apt to go along with White House programs than they are today, so it got the enthusiastic support of the Congress and I, and I think the people. The difficulty with the uh, space station, I believe, is that uh, it's to be a research facility. It's to find out answers to difficult questions. And yet a lot of the politicians and budgeteers and bureaucrats want NASA to list exactly what the answers to those questions are before they fly this research laboratory. Well, that's, uh, that's simply not possible. You can't, uh, that's the whole point in going, is to, is to have a research facility and uh, and to learn as much as we possibly can. I mean, we never would have had the invention of penicillin, for example, if, uh, if the people uh, doing the work had had to uh, take that NASA-like approach and say uh, uh, in 20 pages why they were studying this particular mold or fungus and, uh, and what the spin-offs of it might possibly be. So as a nation, we're really struggling to again, even identify a space policy. Uh, you know, you look at the shuttle space policy, and it's many people consider it a, a, a real disaster. What do you think we have to do to turn things around? There is a uh, a fairly recent space policy uh, issued by the Reagan uh, White House, which makes a good deal of sense, and it includes uh, sending people out into the universe. But uh, that policy has to be backed up with uh, 
a high priority uh, by the president himself, by his staff, by the leaders in Congress. And I don't think that's happened because uh, NASA is still appropriated uh, less than 1% of the federal budget. And, uh, and uh, I think they need a little bit more to get a, uh, an aggressive, uh, a good long-range program going. Mike, thinking back over the past um, 30 years that NASA's been around, uh, what do you think have been NASA's five greatest accomplishments or achievements? I've always thought that the first lunar landing uh, by the end of the decade was probably what NASA did best. I think, uh, uh, in a way, though, uh, I, I think Apollo 8 was a more fundamentally important uh, flight than Apollo 11. Apollo 8, you recall, was the one that first saw men breaking away, breaking the bonds of gravity. And, and reaching escape velocity. Another achievement that uh, people forget but is a little thing called Pioneer 10. Uh, Pioneer 10 is the first uh, manufactured, first object made by humans to leave our solar system. And it's gone out past the orbit of Pluto and is headed out for all times for infinity out into the universe. Uh, I think um, the unmanned landing on Mars by the two Viking uh, landers were, um, I, th I think that was a very important achievement. So I guess I might say, uh, um, this is a short and quick list, but Apollos 8 and 11, Pioneer 10 and Viking. And then the fifth one I'm going to put in the future, and I'm going to say that's the Hubble Space Telescope. Mike, now that you've um, thought about NASA's five major accomplishments, do you think that Mars should be NASA's next major initiative or endeavor? Yes, I really do. I think, uh, I think Mars would be so important and so long-range a goal that it would pull in its wake a lot of things that NASA is uh, trying to do today but not having much success with. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to return to the moon, I, I think uh, probably a better justification for it is that it be a way station on the way to Mars. Uh, I'm not saying that you have to have a colony on the moon or that you must return to the moon in order to reach Mars. You don't. But if Mars were your goal, you might very well discover that the most practical way to get there would be to build a, a lunar colony first. Clearly, if Mars were your goal, you'd need a space station. And the purposes to which that space station would be put would be much more clearly defined. And I think NASA would have an easier time justifying and obtaining the funds for a space station as a precursor to uh, Mars, especially from the human factors, physiological point of view. I think a lot of things would pull in in the wake of a, of a Mars uh, initiative. You know, Mike, do you think that the enthusiasm and the incitement on planet Earth will be as great for a mission to Mars as it was uh, for the Apollo missions to the moon? I think so. I think Mars is a lot more interesting place than the moon, although uh, it is certainly true that the Viking results were disappointing in that uh, they didn't find any life on Mars, no little green men. But the possibility exists that there used to be life on Mars. And I think it would be uh, fascinating to f go digging the surface, looking for fossils, uh, and studying the planet from the surface to try to determine why you have these two almost twin planets, Earth and Mars, and why they turned out so differently. Why the uh, water that one time dug uh, deep channels in the surface of Mars, why did that uh, dry up and blow away? Why did the Martian atmosphere become so thin? How did it dissipate? Uh, what can we learn about our own planet from studying uh, this one that's had such a, a, a different history? Do you think that the mission to Mars should be international in scope? You, that would certainly be nice. Um, complicates an already complicated task, but I think it's worth a try, and I think we ought to, uh, ought to try to put together not just a U.S.-Soviet uh, joint venture, but rather one that includes uh, 
a lot of other countries as well, the Japanese, the Europeans. Uh, let anyone who can contribute technology and money uh, throw it into the pot and do it, uh, do it in terms of humankind uh, leaving this planet and, and establishing a settlement on Mars rather than any one nation doing it. You know, thinking back at the time of the Apollo missions, there were very few nations involved in space exploration. And currently, there are over 100. Go ahead, David. What would be the differences or the implications or influences versus many more people on a global scale involved in space exploration You know, versus just a couple? Well, of course, uh, the more countries that are involved, uh, I, I suppose the more popular, uh, the greater support such a, a voyage would, uh, would enjoy. Uh, it, it does. Uh, the, the, the negative side of it is it makes uh, it makes it very difficult. Uh, it's difficult enough. Uh, I remember from Project Apollo to get uh, two or three American companies all working together harmoniously. Never mind people who are divided by an ocean and uh, different languages, different mores and cultures, uh, even a different system for weights and measures. Uh, One of my favorite quotes in your book is: "These are not ejection seats, but thrones." facing out on the universe, and we are wealthier than kings. By going into orbit uh, aboard, say, a Gemini spacecraft or around the moon or to the moon in the Apollo spacecraft, does it really change one's perspective of themselves and of the planet Earth? I think certainly to go as far away as the uh, moon and look back on the Earth uh, certainly does uh, affect your perspective. Uh, the Apollo command module had uh, had five windows in it, and uh, when you're a quarter of a million miles away from Earth and you look out the window to find it, it's uh, very common to be no Earth in any one of the five. The Earth is down under you, over your shoulder, somewhere else. Uh, so that's a strange sensation to have to maneuver around, even to find your, your home. And then when you see it, tiny as your thumbnail, held out in front of you at arm's length, uh, that sort of gets your attention. A beautiful sight, tiny, pristine, blue and white, uh, very fragile looking object, uh, shining like a beautiful little headlight out there in the black velvet of space. It does change your perspective. It makes you think that we have to take better care of this little fragile entity, because it is fragile. And uh, it also leads one in the direction of, of thinking about problems globally. Thinking back on your own career as a, a Gemini and an Apollo astronaut, okay, I'm I think you had a chance to take a couple of EVAs. Spacewalks, yes, yes, as they were called. Right. Or, could you describe that? And um, was that perhaps in terms of the astronauts one of the scariest things that they have to do? It wasn't. Uh, it was a, one of the most fun things that an astronaut gets to do. It wasn't really, uh, wasn't really scary, uh, but it was... Uh, it's like being uh, cooped up inside a, a bathhouse, let's say, and then suddenly being freed and allowed to go up and do a double back somersault off the high board. It was sort of that, uh, that feeling of release, of freedom, of uh, getting out of a confined space, of having the whole, whole world at your feet, of being able to see in all directions without the confining spacecraft windows. It was a a wonderful sense of liberation, of uh, freedom, of floating, of being one with the whole universe. And today using the MMU versus an umbilical cord, I know it gives much more freedom, but it, it takes a different kind of training, does it not? Yes, the, uh, that astronaut maneuvering unit is a, is a miniature spacecraft in itself, and uh, it's a wonderful gadget. It's flown like a spacecraft. You have uh, each hand uh, with its assigned task to either turn you this way or that way, up or down, or to move you backwards and forwards. And uh, so the people who have, uh, and I've never, never flown with it, but the uh, people who have uh, clearly really are enjoying themselves and have a lot more control over where they go and what they do than you do dangling out on the end of, a, of an umbilical cord. One last question, if you had to give some words of wisdom to young people about the future and their part in space exploration. What might you encourage them, or how? Well, I think uh, whatever their field, 
whether it be space or some other field, I, th I think to try to be the, the best uh, in that field, to really uh, strive for excellence, to, uh, I think that gives people a, a feeling of, uh, of confidence and uh, a feeling of well-being to know that they've put their everything into something and they're the best they can be at it. Uh, certainly was true, I think, of the space program. And, and I think um, the space program will always be an area right on the edge of, of our knowledge, on the edge of our technology, on the frontier of physically and, and mentally of the things we do. And uh, to me, it would be a fascinating area for young people to become involved with. Uh, certainly, as we get into the 21st century, we're going to see some remarkable uh, advances in our space technology and uh, would be a good career to be part of that. The interview you just saw with former astronaut Michael Collins was recorded earlier when he was in Cleveland. In future programs, we will see and visit with other astronauts. Until then, this is Lynn Bondurant saying goodbye from the NASA Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio.